It's the, the old classic where we start, uh, Act One, we start with the young princess, uh, not yet queen, but about to be. And Claire uh, uh, was the right age for the part. She was, uh, I think, under 30. She uh, had very dark hair, dark brown hair, and it was decided that she should have a lighter color, more of a mousy brown or something of that sort. So it meant right off the bat she had to have a wig, even from the, the young scenes. And I was very fortunate in having um, a hairstylist named Virginia Darcy, who had been trained in Hollywood and was skilled with irons and all the, every tool that you could think of, and was marvelous with wigs and so forth. And without her, couldn't have done this. Anyway, uh, after the first act, uh, during, during the first act, she the young, becomes the young queen and so forth. No big deal here. We come to the first break, uh, which was, as I recall it, it was three minutes and 20 seconds, or th yeah, three minutes and 20 seconds is what I believe it was. Now that meant we were out in the Brooklyn studio, which was a big studio, and Claire literally had to run from her last scene, which was virtually at one end of this studio, and run in her big skirts down to the set that she's going to appear in next. And this is the one I organized very carefully. I had one makeup artist with a cue sheet uh, for that three minutes and 20 seconds and um, a stopwatch. And so as soon as this started, he started the watch going. And first, as she ran into this set, uh, two wardrobe ladies would meet her and would immediately strip off some panels on her, her flowing dress uh, that were on Velcro. And they had like 30 seconds. And then the hairstylist, Virginia, was cued to do her bit. And what she had to do was to take this wig that was, um, I think, oh yes, it was kind of up. It had some chignon kind of thing up on the top of her head and move it, move it down to uh, the nape of the neck, uh, which looked a little more dowdy and, and, and Queen Victoria-ish, and it was center parted. And whatever she did, she had like another 30 seconds. Then, and then the cue guy would say, no, to the makeup. And she would run over and sit on a stool facing a small dressing table. Baba Bradovich, who was my chief assistant, and I were standing ready for her, and we had constructed uh, like a cigarette girl's tray that's strapped on, you know, the way so. and on our individual trays we had what we needed, plus I had another makeup assistant. On cue, he would take this large foam rubber appliance that covered the sides of her face and her neck, fat. And he would put this, it was a rubbery adhesive. Um, uh, he would squirt this on the inside of this appliance, that's what we call them, and carefully hand it to Bob and I standing on either side of Claire. And we would take this thing without folding it over and screwing it up. And we would carefully position this around her face and then slap it on, and it would immediately glue. Of course, excess adhesive would get squished out of the edges in places and all that. We had sponges, fairly large sponges, with a special makeup which was designed for me by one of my makeup artists who actually was a kind of cosmetic formulator. It was my good fortune to have this person. So she made up something that would go over the rubber and onto the skin, which wouldn't shine much, didn't have to be powdered in other words, it would save a step, but it would blend this all in. Now she also had a rubber nose. This guy that put the adhesive in would, the next thing he would do would put the adhesive in the nose. Now it was so easy to squeeze that thing, so everyone had to use great delicacy and care. He would pass this over to me and I would stick this on Claire's nose and give it a little squeeze and a press when I had it in place. 
one of the virtues of the adhesive we selected was it wasn't tacky immediately. It would be, have a little slip to it. It wouldn't grab. So it was suitable. Well, we got those pieces on. We quickly, frantically put the base covering all this and put that over her lips a little bit to take some of the red out and over her eyebrows. And that was it. Very cr crude, but enough. And we did that all in the time of, from beginning to end, three minutes and 20 seconds. Uh, and the plan of having the person read off, he kept this, this timer with a stopwatch, kept reading it off. One minute and 15, one minute and 30. We all knew where we were. So we were able to work calmly and not frantically. I mean, if we're putting this stuff on and he's only gotten to three minutes, we know we've got 20 whole seconds left. And so we could take our time and fit, oh, I, I'll smooth this a little bit more. I've got time to do that. I can fix this. Great. You know, and we could wait until uh, 3.15, 16, 17, whoosh, we're gone. Three minutes and 20 minutes. seconds from beginning to end in this commercial. Right. And she comes out supposedly middle-aged right. and chubby. The next one, we had only 1 minute and 40 seconds. And she goes to like 60. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what I had, what I did next was I put on a piece on her lower lip and chin, which really adds a lot of age because it changes the mouth shape and the chin and all that. And I think, I'm not sure, maybe a, a certain amount of upper lip. I know I had heavy eyelids, which look aging and look like Victoria. And I also had eye bags. and. Uh, those were put on, I devised a tiny clamp made out of a bobby pin. Each one had one of these attached to the middle of the eye bag, say, or the eyelid. And again, a little adhesive would be put on the back. They, I could, with this handle, this little pin attached to the appliance, I could literally put the eye bag in position as she looked up and put fingers on either side of it, pull away the clamp, and it was on. Uh, I also made like a large rubber stamp of some forehead wrinkles. I put on a kind of a uh, slightly dark flesh color on there, makeup, and literally stamped wrinkles on her forehead like that. So those changes, oh yes, her, her costume change was very simple. I had made a dowager's hump out of foam rubber. It was sewn underneath a big black shawl. Uh, that was the costume change. It just went over his shoulders. The wig, now here's where Virginia Darcy did herself proud. There was no time to take off this wig. It's all pinned on. She put on a gray wig, you know, a, a typical Victoria pinned back with a bun in the back, with a little pillbox hat and some veiling sewn to the wig. She got that wig on over the other wig without it looking wiggy. It was, uh, I still don't know how she did it, you know, and wonderful. So we did that in one minute and 40 seconds. All that stuff went on, uh, uh, you know, and the wig and the whole thing and so on. Now, poor Claire, especially the first change, when she's sitting there at the dressing table, she's sitting there holding still in terror. She is so nervous, I can see her hands are just, you know, vibrating with nerves. And it truly was a, a kind of frightening ordeal, even though we'd rehearsed it. Uh, but she, you know, did well. It all went through. The thing that killed me, well, then I have to continue with the, thing, the story first. There's one more change. The story has a final scene at her golden jubilee, whatever it was, when she's like 80. And there's a great public celebration, and we find her by herself reminiscing, uh, missing her beloved Albert, who's been dead some years, and so its voice, it, 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 originally the script called for her to be talking to herself. <coughs> I said, hey, we can't possibly add another makeup. Why not take a double and make them up to look like old Queen Victoria, no one will know the difference, and do, have Claire do a voiceover. Uh, uh, and then she gets wheeled out by a couple of uh, Sikhs and her wheelchair out onto the balcony. 
they do a fancy camera shot, a, a crawl and a dolly in. We hear the, the, the uh, cheers of the multitude fade out. That was all agreed upon. Uh, I selected a double and made my first really uh, complete foam rubber mask uh, for the double. All would have gone fine. But when we come to this last scene, uh, the two actors who were supposed to be pushing her out on the balcony, uh, th something happens. The wheels won't turn. They are pushing, and the wheelchair is not moving. And time is running out. The clock is going. We're already over time. And the director is screaming, push, push, get her out, get her out, you know, screaming. Finally, I talked to them later and found out they didn't know what was happening, and after a while, they just shoved her out by might and main and skidded this thing out. The camera came in, did the crawl as fast as it could, zooms in, big, lovely close-up at the end, everything worked fine, black out, uh, fade out, and the crawl starts going like crazy. And they went off the air, they cut, just before it came to the makeup credit. <laughs> However, uh, all the reviews, uh, there were three reviews, and each one of them singled out the makeup. In fact, one of them really said something like it was the, it kind of redeemed the show, it was the only good thing on the show <laughs> was the makeup triumph and so forth. So at least we got some credit the next day in the papers. But that was truly, uh, you know, the most perfect makeup change that we ever did in live television, and that was the last. I mean, mm -hmm. after that it was, it was, it was all tape.